Each year, over 500,000 kids spend time in foster care across the U.S., and making sure they're well taken care of takes a village. I'm Erin Lindstrom, and this is Foster Care Aware, a production brought to you by Tidewater Friends of Foster Care. If you've had it on your heart to become a foster parent, a volunteer, donor, advocate, or just want to learn more, you're in the right place. This episode of Foster Care Aware is brought to you by our good friends over at the Barry Robinson Center. The Barry Robinson Center is a 501c3 behavioral health center. They provide a continuum of services to children, adolescents, and young adults. They offer foster care, ABA services, substance abuse assessment and treatment, and residential care for military-connected youth. They recently partnered with another nonprofit called Together We Can to help prepare youth and young adults for the workforce and are preparing to launch a new program called Next Step to Success, which you'll be able to learn about in a later Foster Care Aware episode that's focused on working with at-risk middle school aged children. The Barry Robinson Center is an incredible partner and we're so excited to share more about them and their outstanding work with you. To learn more, head to barryrobinson.org. Hey, welcome back to Foster Care Aware. I'm Erin Lindstrom and I am joined by Audra Bullock, the founder and director of Tidewater Friends of Foster Care. Hi there. And today we have with us Rob McCartney, the CEO of the Barry Robinson Center. Hey guys, good to join you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Can you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your role at the BRC and what what is the Barry Robinson Center? Can you tell us about your work in the community? Well, unless we have a couple hours to go through that, I'll do the Reader's Digest version. Perfect. Um, first off, I'm the CEO of the Barry Robinson Center. I've been here going on nine years. It seems like just uh, yesterday I took over. But we're a comprehensive behavioral health system that's anchored by a residential program. And the uniqueness of our residential program is our military connection. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about our other programs. And we have very robust community behavioral health services that include foster care, uh, working with uh, kids in need of ABA services. We are also have intensive in-home and we're launching a young adult program, 18 to 24 year olds, with one of the focuses being uh, kids aging out of the system and as well as working with those kids when they're initially interfacing with the court system so we can help with that diversion. We know that kids who are aging out of foster care uh, struggle and they often find themselves interfacing um, with law enforcement. So we've actually been having some pretty good conversations with our local sheriffs and our local local police chiefs. And uh, the first focus would be a substance abuse program, getting them in treatment. But we're looking at, uh, with our partnership with uh, uh, Together We Can, and the work readiness program, uh, getting them ready for work, and as well as we'll be looking at housing opportunities and then traditional therapy. So it's uh, that part is really exciting with that launch. And we hope to have that launch, uh, we'll let everybody know July 1. But our foster care program in the last two years has grown a lot, has doubled in size. And uh, that's pretty exciting as well. Yeah, Robin, you're also a member of the board of directors of Tidewater Friends of Foster Care. So thank you very much for that service. And um, it, and it's a joy working with you guys. I love what we've been doing, especially during the time of the pandemic. Yeah. And we've still been able to reach out to folks in our upcoming partnership with the training we're doing with Attach. Yeah, I'm very excited about that as well. And and love the the passion that you share for these kids in care, the, wealth of experience that you bring to the to the table and leading this organization. I think your foster care is exceptionally well done. And I love working with your parents and some of the services that we offer to. Yeah, they're um, pretty cool people. people. Yeah, they are. I agree. It's a great team. Uh, so Rob, you and I recently spoke and you shared something that really struck me and that I've been thinking about, which is while we're celebrating, so to speak, National Foster Care Month, um, and there are certainly people and projects to celebrate. It's also a time to sort of reflect and remember that the system exists because of trauma that children are going through. And I was wondering, can you take some time and tell us more about that? Yeah, I, I think as what sort of stimulated a lot of this for me, my first job out of grad school many, many years ago uh, was in foster care. And 
so foster care work and kids who are coming in need of foster care who have been pulled out of the home uh, by the court system, uh, we often think that those kids need to be pulled out for good reason, right? They're not safe. But what we fail to always focus on is the trauma that is attached with that. We talk about the trauma of the child's experience, right? But we don't talk about the trauma that has gone on with that biological family. What went on with that, probably with that biological mother. I think in the last 10 years, as people have become more familiar with the ACE and we talk about ACE scores and we're looking at that for, you know, what's happening with those families. And then you're moving a child into a foster home where they may not know anybody, right? And so that's a level of trauma too, as well. And then maybe that's a temporary shelter. And then you got to move that child again. And so we talk a lot about the number of disruptions a child has because we know it's not healthy. But the system itself is, is founded on trauma. And with everything we do, we have to be careful because the odds of it re-traumatizing the child are pretty high. So we need to be thoughtful about that. Not that we don't do them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When I was a lifeguard, I often had, a, I, not often, but several times I had to save people. And it wasn't always fun because I wasn't necessarily, uh, didn't talk to them about, you guys need to let me save you right now. It's right. very forceful, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it, it was a, a trauma, an intervention to help save them. Mm-hmm. But it still was uncomfortable. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to think about it. I haven't really heard it put that way. So I appreciate that. And you make a great point too, even with the lifeguard analogy is like, this is humans helping humans, right? And inside of the world of foster care, there are so many different stakeholders from the social workers, the foster parents, the licensing agency, we have the people in the court system, nonprofits, and all of these people, as we're dealing with um, foster care, we're dealing with secondary trauma as well. So I'm wondering, how does the Barry Robinson Center support people, your foster parents in particular, um, to sort of help them move through this world in a way that doesn't leave them just triggered and jaded and dealing with that second secondary trauma all the time? Uh, Aaron, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think one of the first things we have to understand that many of us who go into this field, we go to it because of our own trauma history, right? And so everybody has their own um, way of dealing with that. But what you have to do is be honest about it. You know, I've had this trauma in my past. And to be aware of the fact that this is influencing who I am, it's part of who I am as a human being, and this is going to be part of who I am as an individual, either as a foster parent or a foster care worker. So that's important to, to be aware. I think the other thing is once people understand that, then they're much more open to say, all right, let me talk about how I can take care for myself. Let me talk about how I need a, a group to support me. If I'm a foster parent or worker and somehow I'm having in our old psychodynamic terms counter transference with somebody and I can't work that out or I don't have time to work that out, maybe I'm not the right person for that to work with this kid or with this family. Foster parents <clears throat> are phenomenal people. You know, there's not a lot of people who are going to open their house up to total strangers in a time of need. But foster parents also have to be aware of what their own Uh, projections are onto that child, what they're looking for. Are they looking for an adoption? Are they they looking for long-term fostering? Is that consistent with what maybe what the caseworker is looking for, which is a temporary and go to kinship care or get back home? And as a foster parent, am I going to be okay if a child stays with me for a year and a half and then the court says, it's time, we've worked it out, it's time for the child to go home. And um, and what do I do with that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, right? And maybe a little of both. And I've had a lot of foster parents who, when their child has, has, has moved out of their home, their response was, I'm done with this. I can't deal with that. So I don't think as agencies, we do a really good job or a good enough job of working with foster parents with that transition. That it's okay for the child to go back. It doesn't mean you're no longer part of their life. This child is regardless if they don't talk with you, they are carrying you with them. You know, my wife's a kindergarten teacher and a phenomenal kindergarten teacher. And to this day, she has adults 
who will call her up and send her cards and say, I remember you as a kindergarten teacher, what you taught me and how kind you were to me and how sometimes how, how structured you were helped me out. And so I think that as foster parents to understand that their role may not be for that forever family, but they're going to be for that forever presence in that child's life. I, I like that too, in the context of what you were saying before of, you know, foster care seems to be this balance of how much damage are we doing by either leaving the home, or leaving the child in the home or pulling them out of the home and then having foster parents fill that role of loss managers, right? Wow. Taking care of these children, not just meeting their basic needs, but meeting their emotional needs and recognizing that they're grieving a loss just coming into foster care in addition to any developmental trauma that they've that they've um, been subjected to. And so we have to one, one of the things that we hear over and over and over again in foster care where is this sense of training and ongoing training. It, it, to take the the initial weeks of training that you receive, it's just not enough, Rob. Right? So, how do you all how do you all support your families in ongoing training and topics that help make them successful? Because you also said people shut their homes, and and nationally we know about eighty percent of the people after licensing shut their home within two years because it's hard work. Okay. And I think that training piece is what makes the difference. So talk to us a little bit more about that, please. All right, so I think when, if you're gonna do training, you have to have a theoretical background. And we've been fortunate that we've been connected to a, a, a woman up at the Klingberg Institute, Pat Wilcox, who wrote the book, uh, Trauma-Informed Care, um, The Restorative Approach. And they have a foster parent uh, training for this as well. So we've had some of our therapists become the trainers for that foster parent part. And they've done some training with that. Uh, we've reached out to Attach and we had Mary McCowan came in and did some tra did a two day training with our uh, foster parents. The training we're doing next month, um, or maybe it's this month, right? Whenever this gets aired, um, taught for parents and for workers is helpful with that. I think one of the biggest challenges because the foster parents are so slammed with so much is how do you get them to do the training? How do you get them to follow through? How do you get them to engage? And that's that I think happens from the very beginning, the front end, and you can recruit folks who understand the value of training and the value of reaching out and asking for help. So you ask Audra, how do we do that? I think we don't do it right all the time because, right? Um, but I think engaging with our foster parents to the point that they trust us. And when they say, get this child out of here, right? That, because that happens, we can step in and ask what's going on. You know, what, what can we work on that? Is it a child testing the limits? Are they going to say, is this family going to uh, hang in there with me? Or is it just a bad placement, you know, a bad fit? Uh, or has the foster parent need a break? And I think for foster parents being able to say, I can't take any more kids for the next two weeks. Right. And for agencies to, even though they're desperate to find a placement, they can put that uh, red line through and say, not today. Right. Uh, so it's, and that's tough too with the agencies. I think the other piece is that coaching our caseworkers. And again, when you have therapeutic foster care, like we do, our caseworkers have case uh, loads of, between that eight and 10, maybe eight to 12 is the max, but very rarely do we even come close to that. And getting our caseworkers who can be able to spend time with their parents, because in therapeutic foster care, the foster parents are that uh, the tip of the spear. And we're supposed to be supporting them so that they can take care of the child. For them to take care of the child, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I was doing this work, it was finding somebody who loved a parent as a good parent. You know, and they would say, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. I've parented kids. Right. I think we'd be, we, that's part of it, right? But our sophistication has grown, understanding what that trauma is, understanding what, where kids are developmentally, understanding that when somebody uh, has some developmental delays and has some verbal processing issues, you know, what that means. So you ask, Laura, how do you do that? It, uh, Audrey, I think it's the, um, getting the foster parents to buy into it. 
getting your staff to understand the role of coach and, and hiring that right staff who can coach uh, and then get everybody on board to do it. Yeah, I and love that. I love that. It's perfect too, because it's, it's walking the walk, right? You're asking these foster parents to model and heal um, for foster children. And you're asking your staff to do the same thing for foster parents. I, I love that. And, and one of the things that you talk about trauma on, on the foster care side of the house, but you know, it's, it's often very traumatic events that lead to children coming into care and often in in our area of the world this is this ha has a high correlation with poverty and the pressures of poverty and i know you have some very important work going on in this area to help alleviate eradicate poverty in in our region can you talk a little bit about that please yeah you see me smiling right so, <laughs> we, so i have a great board and i think mr mcphillips chuck mcphillips will be uh talking more about it uh later but um the board um is it's been focused on what we can do in Norfolk and in, and in Hampton Roads, but focus on Norfolk initially to help reduce our poverty level. In Norfolk, the poverty level for children is about 30%, right? The overall poverty level in Norfolk is about 19%. And so that's about double what it is in the rest of the state. So we know we have a poverty issue with that. So we're implementing a program. We're sort of doing our beta test this summer. It's called Next Step to Success. Um, should have worn my t-shirt, right? Um, and it's, we're doing two four-week session summer camp programs. And the goal is there not to say you're in poverty, come to us, this is what you need to be out of poverty, but it's teaching middle school age kids resilience, grit, increasing their self-esteem, uh, giving them some hope, and hopefully getting them connected to us so that they will then join us the rest of the year in an after school program. And then our hope is that this group of kids that join us in the summer will stay with us throughout their time in middle school and high school. So we can help tutor them, uh, mentor them, support them, uh, help them have access to different mentors in the community if it's business, if it's education, so that we can um, uh, help them realize their dream and for them to have the option to get out of poverty. That's and we know that that comes with obviously education and training, but it also comes with opportunity. And so often I was talking to somebody the other day about workforce development. When I was growing up, um, I had to work, right? But I had opportunities to mow the lawn. My dad bought me a snowblower and said, take care, we lived in Northern Michigan, a lot of snow, take care of ours first and the snowblower is yours. You know, and so yeah, I had the opportunity to do that. When we're talking folks who are living in the cities, those opportunities for work. So our next step on this, right, will be to be working with areas, uh, community employers about being able to help these kids get work and part-time work. And then that's our, our part of our um, Together We Can and the model that we use for work readiness as part of our summer camp program. So next step to success, uh, hashtag 5010. And uh, hashtag 5010 for us is uh, 50, reduce poverty by 50% in 10 years. So that's our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal. I love that. That is fantastic. And I, I think you know, playing into this kind of longer term, you start small in the summer and then you engage these kids on the long term. I think we also have to keep in mind that poverty in our region uh, often is intergenerational. So right. there were a lot of parents that didn't have these opportunities and you're right, in, in our inner cities, there aren't, you know, you're not gonna go cut the grass and, and make money. You're not gonna do a paper route. That, that doesn't work these days. And so giving these kids that access in kind of like the, modern digital world in, from, from a neighborhood that probably is, you know, lacking even digital connection, right? I, I think is extremely important. I, I, I'm very excited to learn more about this when we talk to um, Mr. McPhillips. Brilliant. Well, for anyone listening to this and wanting to learn more about the Barry Robinson Center, potentially becoming a foster parent, or just learning more about the other initiatives that are happening over there, um, you can go to barryrobinson.org to learn more. And 
Rob, I don't know. Do you have anything that you would like to say or convey to people who may be listening and are really, you know, feeling connected with the mission of your organization? Well, the folks who are choosing to listen, you know, you guys are already um, on page. You're listening because you care. Um, and not everybody listening, their calling is not going to be to be a foster parent. And um, there's a lot of folks who think they're going to be foster parents. They go through training and say, it's not for me. It doesn't mean there's not an opportunity to be engaged in the foster care world. You know, you can go on Tidewater Friends for Foster Care and see what we're doing there. There's all sorts of opportunities for volunteer work. Um, there's opportunities to donate. Um, there's also being aware that somebody in your community is a foster parent and some kid that's going to school with maybe your child or had gone to your child is a foster child. And I think that awareness of what it means. Um, and I think you go back, uh, Audra, about foster care, obviously the, in the poverty issue mm -hmm. that uh, I could do a whole nother talk about how we have seemed to have criminalized poverty in our, in our society. Yeah. And my, that's sort of what I broke into the social work field uh, many years ago. Um, and what we can do to decriminalize that, to understand poverty is not a crime. And any of us could be uh, maybe not have living in abject poverty, but we certainly could be hit with situational poverty at any time in our life. Mm -hmm. And that awareness is important. Uh, and the other thing is, too, is that um, uh, if you have children or have nieces or nephews, um, understand, too, that they have friends who could be foster kids. Yeah. Uh, it's a really great point. It is pervasive throughout our communities and we're not always privy to who is in care, but us showing up as a community and understanding that we are only as strong as our, our weakest link and we have to um, make sure that we all pitch in to take care, um, that it's important. It's important to all of us. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, Robin. Thank you so much for the work that Barry Robinson Center is doing in the community. It truly is amazing. Thanks, Aaron and Audra. Thank you for again having me on. I think this is uh, great what uh, the Tidewater Friends uh, Foster Care is doing. I guess because I'm a board member that I get to be included in that. And that's pretty cool, too. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. So much. Thanks. And a big thank you for listening. Foster Care Aware is all about getting the word out about how you can support the kids in care in whatever capacity works for you. And Tidewater Friends of Foster Care is here to support you through the journey. To learn more, head over to fostercareaware.org where you can join our digital community of Friends of Foster Care and learn more about how you can provide a birthday or holiday gift for a child in care as one of our gift sponsors, stay in the know about upcoming trainings, and help meet the needs of current foster parents and youth as they arise. Whether you want to be a foster parent, volunteer, donor, or advocate, head on over to fostercareaware.org to learn more.